Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Sally McNeil? She is the topic of a 2022 Netflix documentary titled Killer Sally. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, and offer my analysis. Sally McNeil was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania on May 29, 1960. According to Sally, her father was unable to regulate his intake of alcohol. Her parents separated, and her mother remarried when Sally was three. Her stepfather was not a fan of Sally and her siblings. He favored his own children. Allegedly, he was violent towards Sally. Sally eventually became interested in athletics. She played a number of sports. She was proficient at diving and the only girl on her cross-country team. Sally was described as fearless and energetic. After Sally graduated from high school, she went to college for three and a half years. She dropped out after running out of funds. Sally enlisted in the Marine Corps. Not long after this, in June 1982, she met a man named Anthony. They would eventually marry. The couple had a daughter and a son. Sally indicated that Anthony was good to her until he became abusive. She filed for divorce and was awarded custody of their two children. The Marine Corps transferred Sally to California. At some point when she was in the Marines, Sally became active in bodybuilding. She attended her first contest on Valentine's Day in 1987. During this competition, she met another bodybuilder named Ray McNeil. She was very attracted to Ray. Sally said it was lust at first sight. Sally's divorce from Anthony was finalized in May 1987. She married Ray in June. It was not a shotgun wedding. Sally was saving that for the divorce. I'll get to that in a moment. In 1989, they moved to an apartment in Oceanside, California. Ray and Sally remained active in bodybuilding. Sally supported the family through her job as a cook in the Marines. She would also collect cans from dumpsters. Ray left the Marine Corps in 1991 to pursue his dreams of becoming a professional bodybuilder. However, at this point, he was still an amateur. Sally primarily supported the family. Ray may have been good at lifting weights, but not at pulling his weight. Eventually, Ray McNeil managed to win a significant competition and became a professional bodybuilder. He had a fair amount of success, but he was nowhere near the top of the bodybuilding sport or art form. Even still, he was determined to chase his dreams. He used steroids frequently. Sally also used them, but not to the same degree. Ray felt as though his career was more important than Sally's so he made sure that he was going to have access to the drugs before she did. Sally would frequently travel to Mexico to purchase steroids. In 1993, Sally left the Marines and earned money by offering private wrestling sessions. She traveled around the country and would charge hundreds of dollars an hour for these sessions. I'll talk more about this in the analysis. The relationship between Ray and Sally was tumultuous. They both attacked each other with some regularity. Sally would hit Ray and throw things at him, including dumbbells and a VCR. Ray would frequently hit, kick, and push Sally. She also claimed that he frequently choked her and broke her nose on one occasion. Many of the arguments between Ray and Sally were because Ray was having a number of extramarital affairs. In early 1995, Sally was planning on moving back to Allentown, Pennsylvania. She was going to take her children with her. Her mother had a house available that Sally was going to rent for $50 a week. At around this time, one of Sally's friends in the bodybuilding community was strangled by her lover. Sally was worried that someday she would be strangled by Ray McNeil. As Sally was planning on leaving, Ray may have been working on plans of his own. He had become serious about a woman named Mary Ann. Some people said that he was planning on leaving Sally in favor of Marianne. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On February 14, 1995, Valentine's Day, 
Ray, Sally, and Sally's two children were at their apartment in Oceanside, California. Sally described it as a fun day, but it would not remain fun for long. Here's what happened that day according to Sally McNeil. At 8.30 p.m., Ray left the apartment to go to a grocery store. He was going to buy chicken for dinner. When he did not return promptly, Sally believed that Ray may have gone to a nearby bar. She put on makeup in preparation to leave the apartment. She planned on going to the bar to look for Ray. Before she could leave to go to the bar, Ray came back to the apartment and they argued. This was at about 10.30 p.m. There were three main reasons that they argued. Ray had purchased chicken that was more expensive than the couple could afford. Sally thought that he had taken so long because he was with a girlfriend. And she told him that he looked like blank and would not perform well in an upcoming bodybuilding contest. During the argument, Ray slapped Sally, pushed her to the floor, then choked her. Sally was in fear for her life. She managed to get away from Ray and fled to the master bedroom. She retrieved a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun fitted with a pistol grip. It was in a case in the closet. Sally claimed that she retrieved two slugs. A slug is a type of shotgun shell that contains a single large projectile, as opposed to a number of smaller ones. They are typically used to hunt medium to large game, for example, deer or elk. Sally exited the master bedroom and walked into the living room as she loaded the shotgun with one slug. She confronted Ray, who was standing in the kitchen cooking. He was about eight feet away. Sally ordered Ray to leave the apartment. Ray refused to exit. Sally fired the shotgun one time, striking Ray in the abdomen. Ray approached Sally. Therefore, Sally reloaded the shotgun as she backed up. Sally then fired again. The second slug struck Ray in the face. Ray was no longer a threat at this point. Sally covered Ray with a blanket before exiting her apartment. Sally handed the shotgun to a neighbor. She was trying to signal that she was no longer a threat. She called 911 and indicated that she shot her husband because he just beat her. Ray was taken to the hospital where he would die a few hours later. Sally was taken to a police station where she spoke to the police without an attorney. She was charged with murder and eventually released on $100,000 bail. Here's what the police found during their investigation. Ray had five different steroids in his system, whereas Sally only had one steroid in her system. Ray was occasionally abusive to Sally and her children. He was having an affair and intended to leave Sally. Sally was routinely aggressive, disrespectful, and violent. Her service record from the Marines indicated she was frequently in trouble. Sally's story about how she shot Ray didn't quite line up with the physical evidence from the apartment. The spent shell from the first slug was found in the master bedroom. This makes it seem like Sally operated the pump-action shotgun in that bedroom. So she cycled the action and the shell ejected there. Here's what the police think happened. When Sally retrieved the shotgun, she only grabbed one slug, not two, as she claimed. She went to the living room, shot Ray, and returned to the master bedroom to retrieve a second shell. She loaded the second shell into the shotgun and cycled the action. This ejected the spent shell. Sally then went back into the living room and shot Ray in the face while he was on the floor. The police found blood spatter inside a lampshade in the living room, which indicates the blood was coming from below the lamp. In addition, Ray's face was close to and aligned with sofa cushions when he was shot for the second time. Sally's trial started on February 14, 1996, Valentine's Day. In March, she was found not guilty of first-degree murder, but guilty of second-degree murder. The jury was also allowed to consider voluntary manslaughter. Sally was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison. In the summer of 2020, Sally was released. She took a job in a warehouse. Sally also found a love interest and married. The good news for them is that Sally has set the bar pretty low as to what qualifies as a good Valentine's Day. 
any Valentine's Day that does not involve a shotgun would be considered great. Now moving to my analysis. Sally McNeil has always maintained that she was not guilty of murder. The issue of her guilt centers on this idea that Sally was suffering from battered woman syndrome. This takes us to the question, was Sally McNeil actually guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that she was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. There is no question that Sally pointed a 12-gauge shotgun at Ray and shot him in the abdomen, reloaded the shotgun, and shot him again in the face. This was intentional. It's not like she confused pumping iron with pumping lead. Ray was on the ground when he was shot for the second time. If Sally was really afraid of Ray, why didn't she simply exit the apartment or call for help? Ray was in the kitchen cooking. He was not blocking the exit. Sally indicated that she told Ray to leave, but he refused. Sally's request is not consistent with someone who is in imminent danger. It makes her look like she was making demands. She was in control, not someone who was trying to escape a bad situation. On the 911 call, Ray can be heard in the background asking, why did you shoot me? Sally responded, I told you I wasn't taking your blank anymore. Sally had fingernail marks on her neck, which could not have been made by Ray because his fingernails were too short. In addition, the marks were inconsistent with manual strangulation. This makes it seem as though Sally damaged her own neck to make it look like Ray had choked her. Sally was angry at Ray for cheating. Ray was killed on Valentine's Day, which suggests that some type of romantically based argument may have been a factor in the shooting. Sally had a history of violence and losing control. Just a few examples. According to her son, Sally beat up a man who hit him, and she wore rings so that she could put dents in the heads of her victims. Like beating them up wasn't enough. She wanted to permanently damage them. Sally beat up a postal worker at one point. At a bodybuilding contest, Sally attacked a female competitor for being near Ray. Sally said that she wanted to make it to where nobody wanted her meaning she was going to hurt that competitor so badly that the competitor would be unattractive. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Sally's daughter heard a choking sound right before the shotgun blast. Her daughter said that she was familiar with the sound because Ray often choked Sally. One witness, who was a friend of Sally's, testified that Sally had bruises and other injuries. Ostensibly, Ray caused these injuries. Both of Sally's children said that Ray was aggressive and violent against Sally and against them. The fact that Ray was having an affair not only gives Sally a motive to kill Ray, but it gives Ray a motive to kill Sally. A mental health professional testified that Sally had battered woman syndrome. This means that Sally may have been hypersensitive to threats and misinterpreted the situation. So the argument here is for voluntary manslaughter. This is sometimes called the imperfect defense argument. Maybe Sally unreasonably believed that Ray was a threat, but her unreasonable belief was genuine because of her hypersensitivity to being threatened. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Sally was guilty of murder? I think that Sally was guilty of second-degree murder. She was not in imminent danger when she killed Ray McNeil. Sally's behavior was reckless for years, it was really just a matter of time before she killed someone. Moving to the next section, here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, from the interviews of Sally featured in the Netflix documentary, it appears as though Sally was a concrete thinker, like she was low in openness to experience. She did not have the ability to think abstractly or to be flexible in her thinking. She had a traditional view of what a romantic relationship was supposed to look like and would not accept any deviation. This is evident when Sally stayed with Ray, even though they were harming each other with some regularity. She didn't view leaving him as an option. She viewed it as her responsibility to stay with him and make it work, as if they were destined to be together. 
this concrete thinking may have led to the shooting. Sally blocked out other non-lethal options, which left her only with shooting Ray. Item number two, this rigid thinking also hurt Sally at her trial. Sally insisted on testifying in her own defense, which is typically a colossal mistake. She was rigid and emotionless on the stand. For example, she responded to questions with yes, sir, and no, sir. In addition, she answered no to a question about whether she had ever been known as Killer Sally. This allowed a video into evidence which had previously been excluded. It featured Sally referring to herself as Killer Sally and holding the murder weapon. Her defense attorney believed that Sally was thinking about this literally, like she wasn't Killer Sally, that was a character she played on a video. Therefore, from her point of view, Sally was answering the question honestly when she said she had never referred to herself as Killer Sally. Item number three, in the background, I talked about how Sally gave private wrestling sessions to men in order to make money after leaving the Marines. Here is the service that Sally provided. She would travel to different areas of the United States and meet men. Sally would wrestle them, during which she would place herself in dominant positions, like putting the men in chokeholds. This was sexually gratifying to her customers, although, according to Sally, no actual sex was involved. People in the bodybuilding community referred to these customers as schmoes, which they meant in a derogatory way. Sally refused to call her customers by that name. When she was arrested for murder, her customers bailed her out of jail. I find it interesting that the name selected to insult these customers was Schmoes, when it seems obvious that the bodybuilding community should have selected the name Dumbbells. This is just more evidence regarding the lack of creativity in the bodybuilding community in the 1990s. Now moving to my final thoughts. Three critical events in this case occurred on Valentine's Day. Sally met Ray, murdered Ray, and went to trial for murdering Ray. This is a fitting metaphor for the dangers of a relationship that appears to be perfect, but is actually deeply flawed. The marriage between Sally and Ray was all just a show. This couple had physical strength, but no amount of muscle can lift the weight of dysfunction from a dangerous marriage. Those are my thoughts on the case of Sally McNeil. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this case to be as intriguing as a shotgun divorce. Thanks for watching.